Welcome everyone to Naropa University. So excited everyone here could join us for today. My name is Kim Fessenden. I'm the Assistant Director of Undergraduate Admissions. And yeah, I know some of you, this might be your first time at a Naropa event. And some of, the, some of you, this might be your hundredth time at a Naropa event. We're really excited to have all of you join us here. We're going to begin with a longstanding tradition at Naropa called the Naropa Bow. This is how we begin many of our classes, many of our meetings. It's an opportunity to just kind of bring everyone in the same space, make sure we're all very present and able to offer um, kind of whatever is being presented. So I'm going to kind of offer an admission style version of the Naropa Bow and if everyone brings their own flavor to it. This is going to be essentially a quick mindfulness exercise to help us just come into the space. So I invite everyone to join with me. But again, you're never required to, to participate in this. So as you're comfortable, welcome to join me. But I invite everyone to begin by gently closing your eyes and first drawing your attention to the space that you're in. Just taking note of Maybe the air temperature in your room. Maybe you notice whatever sounds are present or absent. And then feeling that point of contact between you and the chair that you're sitting on, perhaps your feet are on the floor, feeling yourself supported, held, the ground beneath you. And as you breathe in, recognizing, observing whatever feelings, whatever emotions might be present. You step into learning about a new university. There's so many positive emotions. It can be energy and excitement and curiosity. There can also be challenging emotions. There can be uncertainty, it can be an anxiety. And none of these are the right or the wrong response. This is just an opportunity for you to observe what is there, to allow it to have space to be. And as you breathe out, just allowing yourself to come fully in to the space, into this present moment, knowing that for the next little bit, all you need to do is just bring a sense of curiosity and openness as we learn more about Naropa. And as you're ready, gently opening your eyes, and it's just a simple bow into each into the space. And that is an Naropa bow. We hope uh, for those that are new to Naropa that it is the first of many. It is such a wonderful way to come into a space to start a class. It, um, you, know, you may have had a long weekend. You may be looking forward to the weekend ahead. Um, it's a great way to come into the space. Um, kind of whatever that activity is. So as we get this event started, I invite everyone who wants to, you're welcome to introduce yourself in the chat. You can share your name, share where you're coming from. I know at these events, we often have people from all over the world joining us. So it's really exciting to see kind of who's the, who's the Naropa family that's come together uh, for today. And then it is the start of spring here in the Northern Hemisphere. So what is something that you really enjoy, love about the spring? Perhaps you are uh, enjoying the warmer temperature, spending time with friends and family outside, whatever that may be, invited to put that into the chat. And then throughout the event, you can use this chat to connect with each other, to kind of have an ongoing conversation. And if you have questions as they come up, you may have questions about the admissions process, want to learn more about some of our programs. You can put those into the Q&A session. In addition, um, if you have questions uh, for Dr. Dorian for the sample class, uh, that we're about to have, you can put those into the Q&A as well. And we'll either address those in the Q&A session at the end or an admission staff member will reach out to you. Uh, we wanna be able to get those answers to you. And with that, uh, we're really lucky to have um, our president, Chuck Leaf, join us. I'm gonna offer a quick introduction before he shares some opening remarks, but he has been involved with Naropa really from our origins, involved, involved in some of the early discussions around what it would mean to bring contemplative practices into a uh, university academic context. What does contemplative education mean? He was a founding member of the Board of Trustees 
Um, and he has had a long career as a social entrepreneur, helping grow and lead uh, several organizations that are providing a mix of services that would include affordable housing and healthcare, early childhood education centers, and services for low-income uh, people that are living with HIV and AIDS. In 2012, he returned to Naropa to serve as our president. Uh, he and his wife, the Buddhist teacher and writer, Judy Leap, who also served as Naropa's president uh, for several years in the 1980s, um, they're proud parents of two daughters uh, who graduated from Naropa. And uh, we're really uh, blessed to have Chuck as our president, someone whose his life embodies so many of the values of Naropa, uh, from building community where everyone at Naropa can really be uh, welcome, can really explore and develop their best self, um, to his incredible life of service, kind of meeting the needs of various populations. Uh, so with that, I want to hand it over to Chuck Leap to offer some introductory remarks. Uh, thanks, Kim, and good afternoon, everybody. This is the first time I've heard Kim introdu introduce me more flowery than I've been used to, so I appreciate it. Um, I want to welcome all of you, what, 54 people now online for uh, taking some time to explore uh, possible connection that you might have to Naropa. Uh, it's good fortune that you have that you're signing on today because uh, Marina Dorian is a superstar faculty member, uh, and so your sample class will be uh, an excellent opportunity to get a, a real feeling for um, how uh, the classroom experience at Naropa works. And because she's in the Graduate School of Counseling Psychology, the, the statistics are such that many of you are probably looking at that school. So you'll also have a, a more direct connection to uh, faculty from that school. But it, what she presents will be relevant across both the undergraduate and the graduate curriculum. Um, it is sort of remarkable that um, we are framing what we're doing this year uh, with an eye toward our 50th anniversary year next year, and sort of even more amazing that I'm still standing or sitting, um, having been here in that summer of 1974 when 2,000 people showed up. Uh, we expected 200. Uh, we somehow managed. Uh, but showed up to basically look at whether or not there was a place in uh, the West for a higher education institution that overtly and deliberately wanted to blend mindfulness and compassion practices of all kinds with the more traditional Western academics. And so from that, you know, pretty audacious experiment, but now 49 years ago, uh, within about six years, Naropa moved toward a path of accreditation and by the mid 1980s was a fully accredited university kind of offering the programs that um, many, most of which are still um, in place today. Our teaching methodologies, however, have changed dramatically. Um, we now have multiple gateways for people to join this community. Um, some is our gateways that have changed because of the calendar. You can now start many programs in January and in some cases in the summer, not just the fall, spring uh, academic year. And as many of you no doubt know, there are also now multiple opportunities to uh, connect with Naropa through our hybrid or fully online programs, which um, you know, three years ago, I will say, honestly, there were a couple of those and the faculty had a bit of concern about what teaching online might look like in terms of our commitment to building community. Um, there is no upside to COVID, but if there's any at least possible slight benefit from COVID is that the, what the faculty were able to do pivoting literally over a weekend to start teaching online two and a half years ago or so um allowed them to build some confidence that there was a way if we actually had a deliberate approach to teaching online uh that the Naropa experience could be shared in that way and I think that you know we're we're really grateful to the faculty for doing the work and the feedback we get from students who are learning remotely has been um quite positive and something that's been very important for us to hear it's also allowed us to uh, both grow our student body, but also grow our diversity, which is is an important uh, is an important value for Naropa. The reality is that Boulder itself is a fairly expensive and quite white space, uh, and for some faculty and students, it's just not a place for a whole host of reasons, whether economic or demographic, that people uh, who want the Naropa experience really want to lead, move to for two or three or four years. And, and while we are still very committed to our residential programs, 
uh, the ability now to attract students and to hire faculty who don't necessarily have to be here has meant that the sort of faces of Naropa have changed more quickly than I think they would have if we were primarily still um, the residential campus with, you know, only a couple of opportunities for distant learning. And so that's something which I think is, is uh, very important to us and something we pay close attention to supporting. Um, we are having our graduation a week from tomorrow, and so we'll be saying farewell to several hundred students who have been with us for some time. And as I said earlier, what would typically be then a fairly slow summer, with the exception of the incredible summer writing program, which will start in mid-June, uh, has now shifted. And so within a couple of weeks of graduation, we'll be launching the BA in Psychology, which has a summer entry and some other programs as well. And so the gaps are different at this point. They're more internal meditative gaps than they are calendar gaps. And that's a that's a good thing, I think, to take full advantage of the opportunities that we have here. The other thing that is starting in uh, 10 days is Naropa is working uh, diligently in figuring out our role in this emerging field of psychedelic assisted therapy, which is its own long conversation that I'm always happy to have with people. Uh, but as the uh, states around the country and as the federal government are looking at how these medicines uh, are having an effect on PTSD and end of life issues and major depressive disorders and so on, uh, the need for trained clinicians is acute, and Naropa is one of only two accredited universities in the country that are focusing on training clinical practitioners. The rest are mostly doing the science research, which is incredibly important. But as this field emerges, um, we believe that training uh, clinical practitioners who come with a very strong base and contemplative pedagogy and their own contemplative practices is going to be very important. So it's another area of sort of uh, relationship building that we are making with, uh, with the bigger community. So um, I, I have a few details that I can offer. The admission staff and the financial services staff are the experts and uh, I know are eager and willing to work with you on any of the individual issues that you have. If you have some general questions about Naropa that I can uh, answer, uh, it's in my job description, so you're not all that lucky having me. I'm actually supposed to be at these things, which is great. Uh, and you're more than welcome to send an email to my office, and I'm happy to either uh, respond if I can or to make sure that I get you uh, to somebody that can answer the question. So there's no hesitation, please. If you have anything that you think I can help with, please let me know. And so I want to welcome you. Thank you for taking the time and uh, look forward to uh, connecting with you at Naropa at some point. So thanks, Kim. Back to you, I think. Uh, thank you for those remarks. And one thing you highlighted uh, coming up is our next year is uh, Naropa's 50th anniversary, and we're really excited for that. We're planning lots of wonderful celebrations. So that's definitely something to stay tuned for to see kind of as we pull those all those plans together. Um, and seeing kind of we've got people from all over the country. I wish I could run through everyone's name uh, and where you're coming in from, but we've got uh, people from all over the country, really, yeah, loving hearing your kind of experiences of the spring in the different parts of the country. Um, and coming up now, we're really blessed to be able to have uh, Dr. Marina Dorian, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Marina Dorian speak to us. She is an associate professor and the associate chair of the Mindfulness-Based Transpersonal Counseling Program here. She's a clinical psychologist and meditation instructor. Dr. Dorian earned her doctoral degree in psychology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and has previously held a faculty position at the California School of Professional Psychology uh, at the Alliant International University. Currently, she has a clinical practice that is focused on mindfulness-based therapy, treatment of mood and anxiety disorders, and does couple and family therapy. Uh, she's also been a meditation practitioner in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh for nearly 20 years and fac facilitates a Sangha for mothers. Um, and her interests include yoga, meditation, dance, travel, hiking, literature, and film. We're really lucky today she's going to offer kind of an introductory course um, or introduction to the courses on psychology of meditation and the compassionate counselor. She's going to discuss how to develop your own mindfulness practice and discuss the ways that mindfulness can be used in therapy and experiential education 
putting our learning into practice is such a key part of what we do at Naropa. Um, it's so central to how we do education. And this class, I'm sure, is going to be no exception. We should have opportunities to kind of what does it mean to actually have a meditation practice and, and to develop that kind of a daily pra or a practice for ourselves. I'm really excited uh, to have Marina, uh, Dr. Marina Dorian present a class. So I will hand it over to you for your class. Thank you. Thank you and welcome everybody. Um, I'm a core faculty here in the Mindfulness-Based Transpersonal Counseling Program. And uh, I've had the pleasure of being at Naropa since fall 2018. Uh, currently, I'm actually located in San Diego, California. Uh, and I began my journey with Naropa um, teaching in the hybrid program and teaching online. And then I had an opportunity to move to Boulder, uh, Colorado with my son and spent about two and a half years in Boulder. So uh, watching the slideshow at the beginning, it was just so nice to see all the beautiful places uh, on campus uh, that I love and remember so much. And presently, uh, I've taught both in the residential, in person, and in the hybrid low residency uh, program. And presently, I'm uh, back in San Diego and uh, teaching uh, primarily in the hybrid low residency program and travel uh, once a semester to teach intensives in person. So it's been wonderful to see folks uh, from coast to coast, from San Francisco to Philly, uh, present here in the chat. And so I'm curious first to know a little bit about what drew you all here today. So folks would want to maybe just share, if you feel so moved, what drew you to be here present uh, with us all today? And I could share just a little bit about what drew me to Naropa because um, for uh, about a dozen years, I had a faculty position at, at a um, more traditional university. And really I had kind of a calling. Um, every, every few years, I would hear somebody talk about Naropa and it actually started while I was on my internship. I had a colleague of mine, knowing I was out on the job market, say, you know, she was actually from Colorado, from Boulder. She said, you know, you're really interested in mindfulness and meditation and just working with you. You should really apply to Naropa. And at that point, I just had a lot of family still in Southern California. But, you know, so I ended up back in Southern California. And then every once in a while, you know, the wind would whisper come to Naropa, come to Naropa. And finally, I couldn't ignore it anymore. A dear friend of mine told me, you know, there's a job opening, you really need to apply and kept at it, checking in with me until I applied. And so, so here I am. And, you know, I'm just uh, trying to see, oh, some people here uh, also felt a calling to Naropa, um, interested in Naropa's approach to therapy, interested in getting their master's in contemplative psycho psychotherapy, Buddhist psychology. Uh, oh, somebody here went to CIIS. Yes, they're uh, in, in San Francisco. Very interesting. And so today what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to be talking about mindfulness and compassion and how they're related uh, to the field of counseling and psychotherapy. And I have about, you know, 45 minutes or so uh, with some time for questions. But let me tell you, if I only had five minutes to talk to you about this, I would do the following practice that I invite you to do with me. And that is a brief practice of mindfulness of the breath. So I invite you all to just take a moment to settle into your seat with your feet flat on the floor, or if you're sitting on the ground, feeling your backside and legs touching the floor, your hands resting in your lap, 
your posture upright and stable. Perhaps having your eyes gently half open or gently closed if that's in your practice. Taking a moment to find yourself in your body, in your seat, in this place and time, in the present moment. And bringing your attention now to your natural breath. Connecting with your natural breath. And as you breathe in, aware of your in-breath. And as you breathe out, aware of your out-breath. Breathing in knowing you're breathing in and breathing out, knowing that you're breathing out. In and out. And just watching your natural breath with your attention and awareness without trying to change it. Without really making a mental dialogue about it. Just simply observing and being with your natural breath. The wave of the in-breath rising and the out-breath falling. Perhaps we can share two more of our natural breaths together. So when you're ready, you can go ahead and fully open your eyes and bring your attention back to our Zoom class here. And so this experience of mindfulness of the breath is really at the core of what I wanna talk about today. So many of us, have heard uh, the word mindfulness. And uh, I'm actually glad it's becoming so popular, you know, in our Western counseling, Western psychology, Western health oriented uh, world here. But I think the elephant in the room is, you know, how do we really define mindfulness? And what exactly is it? As we hear people using that term all the time, you know, be mindful of what you say, uh, 
Uh, even I remember uh, my trip to Lon London, mind the gap when you go through the through their subway system. Uh, you know, be mindful of the gap between the train and the platform. Don't fall in the gap. Uh, so, so I'm curious if maybe if anybody feels so uh, so inclined, if anybody would like to share, what do they feel? What do they think mindfulness is? How would you define mindfulness uh, in the chat? You know, what do you think mindfulness is, or what does it mean to you? If anybody would like to share that in the chat. Ah, yes. Uh, practicing being aware to the present moment, intentionally present, awareness, attention to attention. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Being uh, attending to the fact that you are paying attention and connecting to yourself and the environment. Yeah. All these things are really like components of how we can define mindfulness and what that means to you. And, you know, so if I were to give it a, to give it a shot to really try to define, you know, what is mindfulness? And then what does that mean for myself as a therapist? What does it mean for counselors and psychologists? Um, really, mindfulness can be thought of as a type of an awareness or a consciousness uh, that involves, as many of you said, paying attention to the present moment. But as it unfolds, like moment by moment, and without judgment. So really being engaged and aware of one's thoughts, feelings, body sensations in the present moment, uh, without being distracted by other stimuli, without going into the past, you know, or future concerns. So this is the, the present moment is really the moment that we're in, alive and the moment that mindfulness happens. I like to think about, you know, what we often do uh, as people, as humans, uh, is this kind of time travel. You know, we're all time travelers uh, in our own mind, in our own consciousness. You know, many times we are physically like you and I and everybody here, we are in the present moment right now, but maybe our mind, our thoughts go to the past. What happened yesterday? What did he or she or they say to me that upset me? I'm still thinking about what they said that upset me. Or maybe I'm worrying about the future. Maybe I'm worrying about, you know, what am I going to do uh, at the end of the day today? thinking about what am I going to do later, uh, all the work that's uh, in store for me. And so that is missing the present moment, that kind of time travel. And mindfulness is essentially that awareness of paying attention to what's going on, maybe of your body, of your thoughts, of your feelings in this present moment, without judging it as good, bad, beautiful, ugly. It just is. And so this can be practiced um, through a formal practice, uh, like we did, like we practiced mindfulness of the breath, or informally in the way we go through our everyday life, uh, in the way we do our work, our chores. Uh, we could turn that into a practice like washing the dishes. You can wash the dishes mindfully, uh, aware of the water, the soap, all of those sensations, that sensory experience, rather than having it be like such a hard task, like here I go again, scrubbing these pots. I can't believe my son just can't get this off the plate. You know, rather to really enjoying that feeling of what it's like. It's almost like you're taking a shower, but with the dishes. It's a bubble bath with the dishes. Also at a stoplight, using that as a natural mindfulness bell. You know, I do, I have my, you know, formal mindfulness bell here. But certain things in our everyday life can be a bell, like the phone ringing. It, it can 
Give us a message to stop, come back to our breath. Stopped at a stoplight. Stop, come back to our breath. Be in the present moment. So all of these things are just a way to possibly think about mindfulness. And mindfulness, you know, is this awareness that arises out of intentionally paying attention in an open, kind, and discerning way. Um, That's a definition that's often shared uh, by mindfulness teachers, such as uh, Shauna Shapiro, who's also a psychologist. And uh, psychologists like myself, uh, we like to make models. So I'd like to share a model uh, of mindfulness that is actually brought to us by Shauna Shapiro. And uh, this is called the IAA model. And these letters stand for intention, attention, and attitude. And here, what is meant by that is that, you know, mindfulness is something that you do intentionally. You know, you don't accidentally stumble upon it. You know, you have, you set an intention and you really are actually paying attention. So you're bringing your attention intentionally to something like there's always an object of mindfulness. So you are mindful of something. A few moments ago, we practiced mindfulness of the breath. And then the last part of this model, of this IAA model, is the attitude. And for me, I think that that is really important because you can pay attention on purpose to something, but I think many of us may have had this experience where we're paying attention on purpose to something, like we're watching what's going on watching to see when are they going to make a mistake? When is something going to happen? And we're having this narrative, this judgment that as humans, we naturally tend to do unless we kind of train ourselves otherwise to judge like, was that a good thing or a bad thing to kind of categorize it? And so that attitude is one that's really critical to the experience of mindfulness in that you're going to suspend your judgment and you're just going to see what comes up as it is, as an experience. Having this equanimity that it is as it is, having an acceptance and a non judgmental attitude of what happens. So I think that, that the attitude part is really crucial of just really seeing and allowing what comes up to happen. And so mindfulness, it's it's this awareness of what's going on. When you breathe in, you know you're breathing in. And that's mindfulness of the breath. This is something that, you know, everybody is capable of. Everyone is capable of being mindful, and that's a human capacity. So Although this practice is related to and may originate uh, from a Buddhist meditation, it's really a human capacity that we have of being mindful of when we take a step, we're aware of our step and that's mindful walking. And, you know, as I mentioned, there being an object of mindfulness. So if we pause and think about, you know, the origins, uh, the practice of meditation, the practice of Buddhist meditation, it's there's an intention, especially from my uh, lineage that that I practice in the Plum Village lineage, uh, from the teachings of uh, the late Thich Nhat Hanh. The practice of Buddhist meditation may be to generate three kinds of energy. There's the energy of mindfulness, concentration, uh, and insight. It's the energy of mindfulness that could bring about concentration. And so they're really intertwined. 
And when your mindfulness and concentration are powerful enough, then you can touch and see things deeply. Uh, you could discover the true nature of things, to see them as they really are. And that is considered insight. Um, definitely insight is something that's powerful to therapy. And sometimes mindfulness has been defined as remembering. So the opposite of forgetfulness is mindfulness. Mindfulness can be to remember, like remembering to come back to the object of your mindfulness practice, like the breath or your body. And so I'd like to try this practice that we did right at the beginning one more time. I invite you to practice mindfulness of the breath with me again. And this time I really invite you to remember to come back to your breath. Perhaps we could even note when we catch ourselves thinking. So let's take a moment, a few moments, one more time. Noticing your posture. And coming back to the breath. Breathing in, aware of your in-breath. And slowly breathing out, aware of your mind, of your, of your out-breath. As you breathe in, knowing that you're breathing in. And as you breathe out, knowing that you're breathing out. You might even note silently to yourself in, on the in-breath, and out on the out breath. Practicing in and out. And now you may have had a thought or two or 10. And I invite you to think, to, have, to think of these thoughts or to engage with this as if it were like a bubble, kind of like a cartoon thought bubble. you're not attached to it. Perhaps noting when you realize you have a thought. Like, what am I going to say next? Am I going to have enough time? You know, it's actually Cinco de Mayo. Just noting it. Maybe thought. You're not thinking it through all the way. You're not following it down the rabbit hole of a whole story and narrative. But just noting it almost like a little mental post-it thought. And then remembering to come back to the breath.
And if these other thoughts were kind of like a conversation bubble, like in cartoons, imagine that it was more cloud-like, this conversation cloud would just be allowed to float by. You might notice it, but you're not attached to it. It's not like a balloon that's pulling you. It's not a helium balloon pulling you all the way up with it. You're actually just letting it go, coming back to your core, coming back to your breath. And using your breath here as an anchor, you can remember to come back to as often as you need. Back to your in-breath and out-breath. Perhaps we could practice a few more moments of remembering to come back to the breath with gentleness. And so when you're ready now, you can go ahead and open your eyes fully and gently bring your attention back again to our Zoom practice class here, sample class. And so now that you know, we've talked about the practice of mindfulness, you know, uh, this individual practice of mindfulness and us together. I'd like to talk a little bit about how mindfulness is related to counseling. And so I think about this in three ways or three stages. Uh, we've really done the first one, which is the, the, the therapist's own practice. And so I myself, uh, as a therapist, I do have uh, a mindfulness practice. And if I were to do just that, say, you know, I didn't have mindfulness-based psychotherapy uh, or mindfulness-based relational practices that I did with my clients, say I just was, you know, a, psychoan a psychoanalyst or a behavioral therapist, uh, but I had my own mindfulness practice you know, that would offer some help in my therapeutic work in and of itself. Because this kind of practice, it fosters the, the kind of core elements that are found in all therapies. Um, these kind of common factors, presence, attunement, acceptance, Empathy and compassion, which we'll talk about in a few moments uh, as well, and non-judgment. All of these things are necessary for the therapeutic alliance, for the therapeutic relationship. You know, that kind of attunement you have with your clients, um, that this presence that one can develop through mindfulness practice can really help you become a better therapist. So that's the first part is the therapist's own practice. The second part is having a mindfulness or mindfulness and acceptance theoretical framework. And that's something that is like an orientation to the work we do with people that is present focused rather than really going back in time to the past uh, or really future oriented. When we think about ailments, uh, especially psychological uh, difficulties that oftentimes clients uh, come to therapy with. They might involve depression or ruminating, kind of going over and over. It's like you're re-chewing what happened without finally swallowing it. 
You're kind of going over and over it in the past. And that has a tendency towards depression that's past oriented, time travel, uh, or worry about the future. What's going to happen to me? I don't know. Uh, am I going to is am I going to be able to get this uh, position or not? And, and that that worry has a tendency towards anxiety, anxiety challenges with anxiety, uh, and, and can elicit panic. That's that time travel to the future. And so this kind of a mindfulness theoretical framework is present oriented of what's going on with you right now. So I'd like to maybe even just pause and and see uh, for everybody here, if anybody would like to share, how are they feeling right now? To just drop into the present moment. You could share an emoji or maybe a word. Is it calm? Is it bored? <laughs> when is this lady going to get to the beef? I don't know. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is. Yeah, calm, at ease, stillness. So that's really checking in to the present moment. And then the third part uh, that is related uh, to counseling and therapy is actual mindfulness-based therapy. And this is how you can include mindfulness practices directly into therapy. And this could be from really beginning a session with a, a, a meditation practice. And this is something I regularly do, uh, whether I'm working with individuals, couples, uh, or family, I begin my session with a brief mindfulness of the breath, similar to, to what we did. And then there's actual mindfulness-based therapies. Uh, there's quite a few that are you know, empirically supported and researched, uh, like ACT, uh, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, uh, DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, uh, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, and more. So all of these are like, established therapies that have, uh, you know, even, you know, manuals, guides, training, seminars about, um, that have quite a bit of research to back up how, you know, the overarching framework of mindfulness and the implementation of actual mindfulness um, in the therapy has been shown to be effective uh, for, for certain populations. So those are these three ways in which mindfulness is related uh, to counseling. The therapist's own practice, this sort of theoretical framework, and actually uh, doing mindfulness-based therapy in session with the clients. And maybe I'll just take a moment here to take a look at the chat here. Yes, excitement. Okay, wonderful. And so finally, I'd like to talk about, you know, how mindfulness is related to compassion and how those two really are foundational uh, for our work as therapists. So compassion is something that is also talked a lot about, but there's, there's a lot of, um, I think, misunderstanding about what compassion means, how it's defined, um, and how it differentiates from other popular terms. And so I wanted to talk about the difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Now, many of us have heard of uh, something like a sympathy card, you know, and, and so sympathy is feeling sorry for someone and their situation. Um, like, like, uh, I'm sorry for your loss, you know, I'm sorry that happened to you. And really, that's it. You know, here you are, you know, you send them a card, you say you're sorry for their loss of what happened. It's, it's, it's terrible. And that's it. So that's, there's like this lack of real engagement, you know, and maybe that's why they're really are sympathy cards rather than empathy or compassion cards, because just sending a card is like, you know, 
being being behind a screen. You know, there's there's a detachment from it. So empathy is a step further. Empathy is really your feeling and awareness of somebody else's emotion, their difficulty, their struggle. And there's an attempt to understand, you know. Um, so we often talk about how empathy is a quality uh, that therapists, counselors, psychologists, uh, you know, people that work with others in a helping field, that empathy is a quality that we value, that you're you're really aware of what's going on. But I also want to share, you know, that there's more and compassion takes it a step further. So compassion is a step further and it's your emotional response to empathy that creates a desire to help. So that's that compassionate action. So you kind of go from being like back here behind a little greeting card, so sorry for your loss, to like, I feel for you to, you know, kind of hands out, heart open. I'm wanting to help with some compassionate action. And so the reason I make this distinction between, you know, especially between empathy and compassion is that this is something that's, uh, you know, I think rarely talked about, but there could actually be a dark side of empathy where empathy can create division or something called an in-group bias in, in social psychology, where, you know, empathy and compassion are different because with empathy, you know, we join in the suffer in, in the suffering of others who suffer, but stop short of actually helping. And we really kind of empathize with those that are like us, that in-group bias, that, you know, I see those that share my characteristics. And, and I feel that sort of empathy, that joining in their suffering, but I'm stopping short of actually helping. But with compassion, we actually take a step away from this emotion of empathy and ask ourselves, how can I help? Uh, instrumentally or energetically, uh, how can I help? And going a little bit further down into this field of uh, counseling and psychology um, is, you know, is thinking about not only compassion for others, but also compassion for ourselves. I'm curious how many folks have, are familiar with uh, the topic of self compassion and Maybe I'm curious also to hear for whom is self-compassion challenging sometimes? Who's had trouble being compassionate to themselves? You know, I know sometimes I have, definitely sometimes I have, you know, and uh, yeah, I have to remind myself that I have self-compassion because it's not something that comes naturally. I'm reading the chat from one of our uh, participants. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And, and isn't that unique that we could be compassionate to others, but having compassion for oneself as a therapist um, or as a person can be a challenge. And so I'd like to, you know, talk a little bit about self-compassion and, and then we'll do uh, an ex another experiential. Um, and here I just wanted to check in briefly. Um, how much time do we have? Do we have till, till uh, one or a little bit more? Just want to check in here. How much time do we have we have about um three or four minutes and then we'll need to leave that one to go to the individual session ah, okay this. okay all right all right wonderful thank you thank you um so just really quickly i'd like to share um then this idea of self-compassion uh from the work of Chris, Kristen neff really you know shares with us that it's no different from compassion from others but 
you're bringing it to yourself. You're really bringing it to yourself. And there's these three elements of self-compassion, that there's a self-kindness versus judgment of yourself, a sense of common humanity that you are a human that suffers like all others versus isolation, and mindfulness. And here it's that attitude, that equanimity, non-judgmental attitude to negative things and negative emotions versus over-identifying with the negative. So those are the three kind of elements that um, psychologist Kristen Neff has brought to self-compassion. A practice that I often have that, uh, you know, we may not have time to get to today, but it's a loving kindness practice that really starts with the self and goes outward. And it starts with May I be happy, may I be peaceful, and may I be free from all suffering. So perhaps we can just begin with this first one together to ourselves. You might even put your hand on your heart to really come into contact with your body, yourself, your energy in the present moment. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. And may I be free from all suffering. And just let that sit with you. Notice how that feels to wish to your own self. May I be happy peaceful, and free from all suffering. I was asked to put in the elements of self-compassion in the chat. And so we're nearing the end of our time. And um, I'd love to have a few minutes for any questions, if anybody has. And uh, unfortunately, I can't see you all, but I can definitely see your chat. So I'm curious to hear from others. Was was that challenging from anybody for anybody? Or what was it like to offer that compassion to yourself? Because I've definitely worked with individuals, with clients where self-compassion is a big challenge for them, but they can give to others. So I welcome any questions or comments here at the remainder of our time. Dr. Dorian, I do really thank you for the time. I'm actually, I want to be able to move us to the, the next component um, of the experience of written Europa event. But thank you so much for sharing uh, so much with us, uh, both from kind of personal mindfulness practice and to what that, the impacts uh, that can have um, on the, in, in the counseling space and how we can both improve kind of the work we're doing as counselors, if, if that's just the space we're running into, how we can offer those practices to other, uh, so much wisdom in that, um, mm-hmm. in that, in that talk, so much that you shared with us. So we're really grateful for that, for the time. Um, thank you. And thank you everybody for joining. Um, and I'd like to share a bow with you, uh, just to close this portion and you will transition to your other uh, activity here. Thank you, everybody.